Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for um, being here at this Mission Action Partnership um, seminar at Bangor Worldwide. Um, we are both part of MAP, which is a network of about 45 organizations that seek to serve the church here in their mission, both locally and globally. And uh, myself and Mark are going to be taking this seminar, which is called um, The World Doesn't Need Any More White Saviors. Uh, we wanted a provocative title to try and provoke people to come in along, and we can already answer that the world it doesn't need any more white saviors, so maybe that's it, <laughs> but we're going to unpack that uh, and what we really mean by that. But, but first of all, I'm, I'm Nathaniel Jennings. I'm the Ireland rep for the, the mission agency OMF, originally of a, a, an American, English, Jamaican background, born in Bangladesh, but you can ask me about that later. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, but living in Belfast the last 10 years. <laughs> the UK and Ireland Director for Children of the Nations. Uh, Mark Drennan is my name, in case you missed that from the microphone there. Um, and I also am the liaison, international liaison to Children of the Nations in Sierra Leone specifically. So uh, it's great to be here with you today. Yeah, so... so this term, um, white savior, has often been used to uh, critique, criticize um, Western efforts to, uh, um, to, to help those in the developing world. Uh, and, and mission has often been tarred by this same kind of accusation or, 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 or falling under this. Uh, many see Western mission as, as a form of imperialism that undermines and destroys indigenous cultures um, and, and more recently, this white saviorism has come to the fore in things like comic relief, where people have complained about, um, you know, rich, privileged white celebrities holding poor black babies um, to try and appeal um, to, to people back in the UK to, to save these desperately needy, needy people, uh, and, and, and how, yeah, how dignifying that is, and how helpful that is, and what does that actually um, symbolize and what message does it give? Of course, we want to acknowledge that that, that most people um, have are well-meaning. They're, they're trying to do good, and we ourselves represent organisations that want to involve the UK and, and, and Ireland Church in praying, giving, going, serving those in, in Africa and Asia. So, so, so we're certainly not going to be part of a seminar which is saying um, we should no longer be involved. In, in international mission work or international humanitarian work. Um, but we continually need to be assessing um, how we go about this to make sure that we're really honoring the people um, that we say we want to serve and that we're not actually doing more harm in the process of trying to help. And that's really what this um, seminar is, is discussing and exploring. Um, we're gonna be looking at um, four models, um, kind of as a, a helpful, hopefully, structure to think through the different approaches, present and past, that have been taken um, by, by, by those from the West trying to engage with um, other parts of the world. And uh, we would advocate for and say the best model is, is the final one, the one we're going to spend um, the most time on, um, the community-initiated model, but we're going to work through them. And when we talk about um, rich and poor in this seminar, we're not just talking about economic terms. Um, we mean by rich, one side feeling that they have something to offer that the other um, lacks, and this may well be material, physical things, but it could be ideas, it could be rights, it could be perceived spiritual needs. Um, so for example, we, we have people living in Japan, sharing the gospel, that's a rich, high-tech, very secure country, uh, 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 but with a tiny Christian population, uh, and therefore um, we, we would, we would um, give people opportunity to go and, and serve in that country, just to show it's not all about um, difference in, in, in wealth, material wealth. I, I want to just frame the beginning of this um, seminar to show just how the, the, the world has changed since the Western mission movements really started 100, 150 years ago. Um, we can see here um, just where, where, the, where Christians are concentrated, um, the percentage of the, the population that is evangelical and we see the, the, the darker the green, the higher the concentration, uh, and, and, it, and it's very obvious um, that, that uh, large parts of what we'd call the global south are now very um, Christianized. The next slide is very encouraging. It shows um, Christian growth, where growth is taking place. 
Um, the dark green is, is uh, over 4%. Um, the gray is actually where the Christian church is declining. Um, quite sobering if you look at Europe. Very encouraging if you're looking at Africa, if you're looking at parts of the Middle East, if you're looking at some of those places where we actually think it's very hard to be a believer, and yet the, the church is growing in those parts. Um, another very interesting graph, um, you look at the, the, the countries with the most Christians in 1900, USA, Russia, Germany, France, Britain, Italy, Ukraine, Poland, Spain, Brazil. Um, look at the projected um, countries that are going to have the biggest populations, Christian populations in 2050, USA, China, Brazil, Congo, India, Mexico, Nigeria, Philippines, Ethiopia, Uganda, not, not a single um, European nation, um, and that's just in the course of, a, of a 150 years. So we can see that uh, Europe is certainly no longer the hub of Christianity, uh, and, and uh, we need to find our place in this global church. And we need to think, especially I'm talking about organizations like ourselves that were established when Christendom was strong in the West, in Europe, to go and reach the rest of the world. And we have to really seriously think uh, the way we were structured, the way we were designed, our vision, the way we work, is it fit for purpose in the modern world, which is so, so different. And, and I don't believe, just from the start, some people talk about it, it's about passing on a baton. You know, we're passing on the baton to... Um, another part of the world, you know, we, we, we've declined and, and they're the future. Um, I prefer to uh, think of we're in a boat, we're in a rowing boat, and, and you need many people, and we need to find our place in that rowing boat. We're all rowing in the same direction together, but we have different parts, and, and therefore it's about where we sit in that alongside brothers and sisters from around the world. I'm going to um, look at the... Yes, uh, that, that was another very interesting one I, I, I missed, and that's just showing the... The, uh, that, that, you know, in 1910, um, the, out of all the Christian population of the world, 66% were found in Europe. Um, 2010, only 25%. So just the, the, the huge, huge shift. And finally, just to bombard you with a few more statistics, um, the, the, the global north in, 2000, in, in 1910, uh, that's where 82% of the world's Christian population was found. In, in 2010, it's only 39% and 60% of, of, of the Christian population is found actually in what we call the, the global south. Um, but let's look first at this, this uh, more traditional compliance model, what we might call the compliance model. And it's very easy, I, I want to start by, by saying, it's very easy to look back at what early mes Western mission work um, through contemporary eyes and be very, very critical. But of course, it was a, a very complex thing. Um, sadly, a lot of Western Christian work was done by people who had the mindset of racial and cultural superiority. superiority. They, were, they were products of their times and their societies. They, they, they rode in on the coattails of colonialism and they bought into the idea of the white man's burden that, that was their duty to civilize the rest of the world and, and civilize generally meant westernize. And they, they didn't distinguish between what was the universal eternal gospel and what was all the western cultural packaging that, that they had wrapped it in and then tried to deliver. And they did this uh, by causing great damage as they, they, they um, um, unnecessarily demonized local and indigenous cultures. Um, those who wanted to accept Jesus often had to give up um, their, their, their own culture, um, their own background. This, this led also to um, depriving them and undermining their own self-esteem, their, their own pride in who they were, their own self-worth. Uh, and, and, and this way of Christian work actually has a legacy to this day where, where, where one of the biggest barriers to the gospel today can be in places where people say this is a, a Western message, this is a, a Western religion, uh, uh, and, and partly that was because that's the way it was um, delivered to them in the past. So I think if we want to help repair that damage um, and also not make the same mistakes, we need to acknowledge this and even apologize where we need to. But of course, there were missionaries who um, dearly loved the people they came to serve and to share faith with. Um, they wanted the best for them, and they, they went through a lot of suffering. They gave their lives to see people blessed and God glorified. And even if they made mistakes, they left legacies of transformed lives 
and Christian communities that still exist to this day. And in the midst of these mixed bag of missionaries, there were those who were thinking and practicing way above their times. Sometimes they were an exception. You think of someone like William Carey, who is known as the, the father of the modern Protestant mission movement. He went to Kolkata all the way back in 1793. He set up schools. He set up the first university in India that awarded universities. He campaigned for women's rights. He was a master and lover of Indian languages. He, uh, he translated the Hindu classic, the Ramayana, into English. He also translated the Bible into Bengali, Oriya, Assamese, Mar Marathi, Hindi, and Sanskrit. And he's revered by Indians, both Christian and non-Christian, to this day. This is what the Asiatic Society of India commended um, Carry for. They commended him for his eminent services in opening the stores of Indian literature to the knowledge of Europe and for his extensive acquaintance with the science, the natural history, and the botany of this country and his useful cont contributions in every branch. And then Hudson Taylor, who founded our organization, he went to China in 1853. Um, he was radical for his time because he um, adopted Chinese dress, culture, and customs and insisted that, that his colleagues did the same. He famously said, in all things not sinful to the Chinese, we become Chinese so that we might win some for Christ. Um, uh, paraphrasing what Paul had said um, in, in Corinthians 1, uh, chapter 9, verse 22. And also he, he, he said things like, Westerners who went to China, they should be merely scaffolding and, and they should uh, be removed as quickly as possible to go on to the next place and allow the building to stand on, on, on its own feet, um, self-sufficient and run and, and, and multiplying um, in indigenous ways. He, he also very early um, on decided that all decisions should be made in the fields, not, not in, in centers. Many um, Western mission agencies were run from, from, from London, from thousands of miles away. Decisions were made about local context, uh, and, and that wasn't going to be the case with the, with the work in Asia. He also condemned the British government's meddling in Chinese affairs um, and a lot of their policies, which were seeking to exploit the land and, and, and the people of China. He went as far as when, in response to this, there were anti-Western riots. He refused protection from the British army. When his properties were then destroyed and the British forced the local authorities to compensate him, he refused to accept that comp comp constant compensation. And this really won him great favor in the eyes of the local people. They saw that his loyalty was not to his, 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 his nation or his ethnic group, but it was to justice and it was to being godly and, and, and being right and to the people he was there to serve. And I think we can, it's good to remember these positive examples because we will meet people who will um, tar all Western mission work with the same brush. Uh, and it's good to, to acknowledge there were mistakes, uh, um, but yet there were, there were it, um, it was complicated and there were different people working in different ways. However, we have to admit that uh, much of the early Christian engagement in the global south generally fell under what we would term the compliance model. And this is where Westerners came with resources and knowledge they thought the poor locals lacked. They may have been well-meaning or not, but they decided how the locals needed helping. This meant they set the agenda, they decided what the locals needed. They held the power and the superiority and they reinforced the local sense of inferiority um, at the same time. And unfortunately, this is the way um, some uh, work is still done by, by Westerners in, in the global south. Uh, when I lived and worked in Bangladesh, it was very hard to watch some Westerners who I think really enjoyed the, the honor and authority that they were given um, in the country. Many of them barely knew the language, they didn't know the context, they didn't know the complexities, but they assumed positions of power because they were given them because they came with resources and they felt very good about helping these poor people. Uh, and often they were working in ways that just created dependency and, and what we'd call client-patron relationships and were doing more harm than good. Um, and these are kind of the, the pitfalls of, of, of this, this approach. But Mark's gonna tell us about the, the a slightly better approach. <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna talk about this uh, consultant cooperation approach. So one way of summing up paternalism would be to say it is habitually doing things for people, providing things for people, and deciding things for people that they can do, provide, and decide for themselves. So this next category in our, on our continuum is a step in the right direction when compared to what Nathaniel was just talking about, but can, to greater or lesser degrees, 
involve doing things for people. Um, so as that's going to be clear and as going to, is going to be the case with all of these models, there's a spectrum within this, um, starting from the most paternalistic to greater levels of local participation. So at one end, we have at least an element of consultation with opinions of local people being listened to, uh, maybe some local people serving on staff teams, but people from the outside still perhaps being the ones that are analyzing the problems, coming up with the solutions, and deciding what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. And the worst examples of this, I think we would all, um, we would all recognize and we would all pretty quickly reject, especially when the outcomes are dramatically bad. Uh, so I'm going to share an example, a well-known example of an initiative um, called Play Pumps. I've got a picture of one here. Uh, a merry-go-round connected to a borehole well. Some of you might remember when these uh, came out. I certainly do, actually. Um, and as the children play, the spinning wheel uh, pumps water up into a raised tank. Millions of dollars were invested in this with plans to provide water for 10 million people. Uh, but these pumps were four times more expensive. They broke uh, quite quickly. Children didn't want to merry-go-round all day long. And it became difficult as well for women who saw the normal village pump that they could use by themselves replaced with a merry-go-round with no one asking what they thought of that first. And reports by groups like UNICEF pointed out very strongly to the lack of ownership, the lack of consultation, and the lack of choice for why things went badly with this particular initiative. Lots of lessons were learned, but I think we would all see that this isn't how things should be. It is at the other end of the spectrum where perhaps things become more complicated, uh, because at the other end you will see a lot more cooperation. Local people working with people from the outside to determine priorities, to determine best courses of action. You wouldn't see uh, hand pumps being replaced by merry-go-rounds with no one talking about it first. Um, at this level, you would expect a focus on building local capacity. You would expect to see local assets and abilities reinforced rather than replaced. So lots of really positive things. Uh, staff teams might even be majority local. However, where the challenge is, is when the ultimate responsibility for directing what happens and directing that process is still held by people from the outside. Uh, perhaps there's an international leadership structure, perhaps the supervisory board is entirely international. So we need to consider seriously why that would be the case. Um, if this is the case, is it because um, there's historical reasons why the organizations were set up this way initially? Uh, is it because of something to do with where the money comes from, um, how it was generated? Uh, is, it, is there a genuine local capacity issue in the particular technical area? Who are we ultimately accountable to in this model? Donors and international supporters or local stakeholders? And is there a goal for more participation and responsibility being handed over over time? We have taken a lot of this idea of these four models from a book called Where Helping Hurts, which we would highly recommend to everyone, where the authors discuss how a biblical understanding of poverty recognizes its roots in the brokenness of our most foundational relationships. As Nathaniel was saying earlier, it's not just about money. So those foundational relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with creation. And research shows that shame, a broken sense of self, a poverty of self, um, is often felt by people experiencing material poverty. Instead of seeing themselves as made in the image of God, there's a sense of inferiority. At the same time, the economically wealthy can experience a different sort of broken sense of self, a different sort of poverty, uh, a subtle sense of superiority, especially when poverty is understood only in material terms. The book calls it a God complex. The point they go on to make is what's uh, explained here on the PowerPoint. When we bring together the God complexes of the materially non-poor with the feelings of inferiority of the materially poor, everyone can get hurt. And this is going to be true where the subtle sense of superiority is built on things even other than material wealth. 
So this helps demonstrate what is at risk when we hold on to too much control uh, in a place like where I'm from. We say we want participation and partnership, but when it comes to those key decisions about money or theology or vision, um, we are maybe wanting to hold on to final approval. But by doing this, we're missing an opportunity to demonstrate the gospel, that we are, all of us, the global church is the body of Christ, that we are co-laborers with Christ, that we are the body of Christ made in the image of God, and we are all made to drink of one spirit, is what the Bible tells us. This isn't to say that Western churches or Christians or partners should not dialogue and pay close attention to issues of money and theology and vision, but is there a dialogue is the question we ask ourselves, and how equitable is the dialogue? And how can we ensure that our international partner is not just a means of achieving our own aims or those aims of our organization that is on the outside? So as you think of the nuances of why some of our ministries might have elements of this part of the continuum, we need to challenge ourselves to reflect on what could be done to deepen the level of participation. To borrow a quote, how can we make things as local as possible and only as international as necessary? And that's the challenge as we think through these models. And the final is going to go on to the next one. So the co-creating model, that's a positive evolution in the models of, of partnership. And co the co-creating model really was trying to, or is trying to address some of the, the problems with the consultant corporation model, which Mark has just um, described to us. Uh, and it represents a, a crucial and fundamental switch from doing to or for the poor to doing with them, uh, alongside them, true, true partnership. And that's how many of our organizations um, seek to work. From the very, very beginning, we seek to involve those who we want to see blessed. Um, consultations are held with local community. They're asked about their felt needs. They're asked about how these would be best met. Um, and then they are involved in seeking to create and deliver the means to do this. And they're involved in the ongoing reviewing and developing of these programs and initiatives. The local community feel that, that they own these initiatives. And over time, the input from the outside partner comes only at the request of the local community and where it's deemed appropriate. But even with this model, um, we still need to be cautious. I still think we, we need to be aware that, that um, the very fact that an outsider is coming in looking to help creates a, a dynamic. Um, they, they obviously feel that they are rich in something that the local community are poor in. They come with an, an assumption of, uh, uh, of um, what that is and how it needs to be addressed. And if they're the ones with the resources, particularly the financial resources, it's very difficult them, for them not to use this to influ influence the agenda according to their own desires and opinions. And locals might be quite happy to pander to this because after all, they have the resources and present themselves as the, the experts. Um, and, and we can also romanticize the poor or the so-called poor. Um, they are broken just like us, like, like Mark has referred to. Uh, and if we don't take time to actually learn, listen, understand the context, listen to the whole community, we can end up attracting characters who are happy to take our resources and let us deliver um, our, our agenda um, and, and are not actually blessing um, the community uh, as, a, as a whole. Uh, um, so we need to have that gentleness and humility, but also that, that wisdom and, and winsomeness, even when we're trying to uh, co-create. Which takes us to the, the final model, which we think is the, the best and ultimately want to be involved in, and that is the community-initiated model, wh which Mark is going to talk about. Yeah, thanks. Um, so at, at this point in our continuum, we have this community-initiated um, and community-initiated activity. So local people setting their own agenda and mobilizing to carry out that mission without outside initiation or facilitators. Uh, these are local churches, local ministries, national charities, and we could sum up the, the role of the outsider or the someone from internationally in this as responding to, so responding to uh, the activities um, of those local people. 
1995, war was raging in Sierra Leone, and particularly defenseless were the children. So we believe at Children of the Nations uh, and that, that the establishment of Children of the Nations was part of how God responded in mercy to the prayers of those children. Uh, God brought together two couples in Freetown. There's a picture of them now. Uh, Chris and Debbie Clark from the US and Geneva and Augustine Davies from Sierra Leone. And looking at our ministry story, I would say you would see elements of co-creation and community initiation right from this beginning. Chris had grown up as a missionary kid in Japan and Liberia and was particularly struck by what can happen when missionaries leave their international fields. Uh, Debbie, his wife, had not been to Sierra Leone uh, before, but had a background in special education. Geneva and Augustine had lived in post-colonial West Africa, with some really familiar ministries being formative in their lives and their growth and their experience and their service and their leadership up to this point, including Youth for Christ, Scripture Union, and Child Evangelism Fellowship. Augustine was ordained uh, into a Presbyterian church that actually had been planted in Freetown by Korean missionaries. And moved by what they saw on the streets of Freetown in 1995, uh, these two couples launched Children of the Nations as a local children's ministry in Sierra Leone with a board of local professionals. The next slide is a cross-section of some of those that serve on the board currently. Doctors and lawyers and accountants and pastors and educators, all volunteering to oversee the ministry and its staff. Uh, we've continued to refine uh, and develop our collective approach and what I'll share with you now is what we have gotten to, serving over 5,000 orphans and destitute children in five countries every day with a vision of raising children who transform nations. So this next slide is a graphic of what we have come to call the COTN Global Alliance, which represents how we are structured around a shared identity that the boards of all of these uh, countries have developed themselves. So we've got Children of the Nations in Uganda, Haiti, Malawi, Sierra Leone, and the Dominican Republic, also in the US, in Canada, and here in the UK and Ireland. And boards have come together to come up with this shared identity, which is right around what holds us together. And it starts with a statement of faith, a faith that says to love God and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, a faith that is described as pure in James 1.27, when it cares for widows and orphans in their distress, and keeps itself unstained by the world. So born out of our faith are our core values, our vision and mission. And the boards have committed themselves to certain standards that they expect in the services their ministries will deliver to children and principles, principles which will guide the, their operations. Everything else is country specific, driven by local needs, strengths, opportunities and values as those local boards see them and understand them. Ours is not the perfect model or a perfect model. We are fallen people trying to work together. There have been failures and breakdowns in communication and challenges in relationships, but where we are, where there is conflict, there's an opportunity uh, to learn and grow and improve together, um, just as in any real relationship. And I think that's a key point. What ultimately helps us to work through the details of how we can successfully work together as a global church is going to be through genuine, equitable relationships. Relationships that both sides are choosing to invest in. Relationships built on the kind of openness and honesty uh, that over time builds trust in both directions. One thing we at Children of the Nations have been trying to improve on is the shared ownership of this entire alliance and so this year we have launched our Global Alliance Council where members of each board uh, have been nominated to work together uh, and discuss and, and develop what this whole alliance is doing to ensure that children are experiencing the love of God through Christ-centered holistic care that leads to transformation. Again, ours is not the perfect model or a perfect model, but I present it to you as an example of the local and international trying to run together in partnership. Uh, there's so much better when it is local. Local is fast because it's close. Uh, local has better access, something that the pandemic has once again underlined. Local understands circumstances, politics, and culture. Local is long-term, it doesn't go home, it is at home. Local is cost-effective. 
And I think, uh, again, about the idea from where helping hurts, of how our models are either feeding into broken senses of self, or they are challenging those. Um, and I love that when children at Children of the Nations look around to see who's caring for them. If you show the next slide, Nathaniel. They see people who are sacrificing for them, teaching them, praying for them, nursing them, caring for them, that look just like them, that have backgrounds just like them. And I think there's an inspiration here for our, those young people that they, they can play those kinds of roles for people in their lives as well uh, today and tomorrow. And that's what we've seen since 1995. As children have grown and taken up leadership in their communities, in their families, their churches, their careers, uh, children like Henry in Sierra Leone, who was befriended, you'll see a picture of him in our next slide, befriended by a group of boys in the program in Sierra Leone. The boys spotted him uh, whilst they were playing football and they invited him to come and play with them. And at the end of the game, they shared their lunch with him. And Henry and his family were subsequently cared for and supported by Children of the Nations in Sierra Leone in transformative ways. And he is now, as you can see pictured here, principal of one of our primary schools, one of the primary schools that COTN Sierra Leone operates and the leader uh, in one of the churches that they have planted. As you know, on the 14th of August, there was an earthquake in Haiti which killed, uh, at last count that I saw, over 2,200 people. A team of Children of the Nations Haiti's board and staff visited some of the devastated communities to consider how they might respond just a few days ago. One of the members of that staff team is actually a graduate from Children of the Nation Malawi's programs and has been serving as a missionary with COTN Haiti for a number of years. At the same time, Children of the Nations in the neighboring Dominican Republic were looking through their medical supplies to see what they could send across the border uh, to their brothers and sisters in Haiti. Uh, and the two have been in communication to make sure that what is sent is the same as what's needed. And we have just received uh, the first draft, of the response plan created by Children of the Nations in Haiti and are looking through uh, how can we help with aspects of that. I hope this gives you a sense of what, how we are trying to serve one another. Uh, as imperfect as we all are, but knowing that Ephesians 4 tells us that speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part, if working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and I think this community-initiated um, development or, or, or model is really how, how the church itself has been established and grown and survived. Um, I read a very interesting book, uh, and, it, and it was about um, global theology and taking theology that was birthed in different parts of the, the world. And it was so rich because cause, cause, cause people out of their own cultures and their own context obviously saw things in the Bible um, which maybe Westerners ha had missed, uh, and it was very enriching, but, but it talked at the beginning about um, the, the, the church growing, um, being serial growth, um, opposed to, say, Islam, where you have a, a cultural and geographical hub for, for out of which um, the religion spreads, and it still looks back to uh, as kind of the sacred place, um, or, or Hinduism in India. Um, Christianity ha has sprung up in indigenous communities all over the place, uh, and, and, uh, and the church has been, when it's a good, biblically sound, culturally relevant church, it's been rooted in that culture. Those, those people have been able to be truly disciples of Jesus. Their identities in Christ are part of a global church, and yet truly Chinese or Nigerian or Bangladeshi, and there doesn't need to be a, a, a conflict in that. Uh, and I think actually this community-initiated model um, represents that, that, that actually God reveals himself to, to people in their context, and, and they need to feel um, absolutely secure, and, and, and that their place as who they are is just as worthy um, as the place of, of someone from a country maybe that has a much uh, longer Christian heritage, or, or is richer, or is more educated. They shouldn't feel that sense of inferiority, which often um, models of mission and development have caused, I think, um, an imposter complex for a lot of people from the, from the global south. 
um, b b because of th these dynamics, uh, and that is not um, biblical. And a truly community-initiated model, um, we, we can see this actually springing up all, all around the world, um, where, where local Christians are taking initiatives to glorify God and to love their neighbors, and it's bearing uh, much fruit. And when we come across um, one of these movements, God at work, um, displaying his glory and, 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 uh, and blessing communities and drawing people into the kingdom, uh, the temptation can be for us to try and hoover them up. <laughs> like, oh, God's working over there. Okay, how can we um, get, get in and, uh, <laughs> and put it under our, our umbrella? And uh, um, uh, that is a temptation, and I've, I've seen that, that happen, you know, a, a move, people movement in a part of Bangladesh, and multiple missionaries or agencies discovering, okay, we've been working over there doing this, but God's doing something completely over, different over here. Let, let's get in touch with that leader, and, and, and maybe he can be affiliated to us. Uh, and, and there's even been like bidding wars, you know. We, we, we can give this much to each of your disciples if you join us, or we can build you this many churches. And that actually example of, of trying to help but, but hurting. Uh, uh, and, and that, but that's part of a, an arrogant posture that they need us. We need to give them something and even maybe justifying why you're in that part of the world in, in, in the first place, to, to be a little bit cynical. <laughs> I'm just saying, saying some worst-case scenarios. Um, but, but really, when we discover these community-initiated models, surely we should be asking, how, how can we engage with these initiatives? Um, how can, can we bless or serve them? Uh, and maybe sometimes the best thing is that, that, that we don't need to. They're, they're, they're fine. They, they've got the spirit. They've got the word. They've got intelligence. They've got, they know their context. We'll, we'll, we'll bless them and pray for them. And maybe we'll tell their stories to other people to just show how, how good God is. Um, but, but maybe as their brothers and sisters, we do have a role to, 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 to work with them and to bless them. And we've got things we can contribute um, but how do we do that without seeking control? And that's the really difficult thing. Um, how do we engage? How do we communicate? How do we bless and encourage without already thinking, okay, how, how, how can I improve them? How can I make them better? What, what, what control can I take? Which actually may stifle the work that God is doing. And even more than that, what, what can I learn from them? What do they have to teach us? If I engage with them, how will I be transformed? How will my community um, back home be transformed? How can I tap into what God is doing around the world in a way that's going to bless and transform and teach me rather than coming in as the expert, as the teacher, as the person who wants to give? And this takes a real uh, mindset change um, as we try and engage in, in, in global um, ministry. And we have to uh, think, yeah, it's not about us initiating. It's about us being invited. It's about God being at work and us tapping into that where it's appropriate and, and in this model of community initiation, they have complete ownership. They are the experts. They decide the agenda and what we can contribute to it. We listen, we learn, we watch. Um, we don't try and jump in with our wisdom and our resources. Uh, and, and a genuine relationship, I think, should evolve this way anyway. Um, this is the kind of relationship. Then, if it does evolve, it's much more going to be healthy and genuine and sustainable. And it's the kind of initiative which will out last outsider. Uh, we have to leave the country. We have to go, uh, 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 and it's not being built uh, on our resources and our structures. It, it's genuinely um, indigenous uh, and of the people and of the place. And, uh, and it's wonderful to see how this is taking place. Uh, Asia, in its South Asia, the Philippines in its poverty, exports um, human labor um, all over the world. Um, but particularly to some um, very wealthy parts of the world which, which are very, very unchurched. And yet, many of these migrant workers are, are, are believers, and they're witnessing in these places missionaries could never get to. Um, and and, and so, so something like that is an indigenous initiative of those people, and, and we need to be praying for them and blessing them. And maybe there's a place for us to encourage, to care for, to resource, to train, but that's something that, that God has allowed to happen just through um, economics uh, and, and the apparent chaos of the world and, and the poverty and people seeking a better life, yet, yet people crossing borders and going to places where they can now be witnessed. We're also seeing, especially in Asia, many indigenous mission movements where people uh, who, who, who found Jesus, they've 
formed Christ-centered communities are now wanting to um, just they're reading the Bible and they know they need to now share it with another group, um, another another uh, ethnic group or linguistic group within their country or even across the border. Uh, and and it's wonderful that's happening in many places, places we may not even be aware of. But when we discover that, is there is there a way we can um, advise, a way we can um, uh, encourage? Um, shouldn't have used the word advise, but but is there? <laughs> can we can we uh, yeah um, find out and encourage them and pray for them and, and maybe even share some of our own experiences of of, of both the, the the positives and the many mistakes um, that the the ancient Western Church has made in trying to do cross cultural ministry and and humbly you know help, help our brothers who are who are excitingly in, in engaging that in, in new and and fresh ways. Um, and yet, still, I, I think there is a need for deeply embedded cross-cultural workers uh, moving in all directions. And I think uh, long-term Christian cross-cultural work is a very hard sell these days. And part of that is because people get mixed messages. On one hand, we're saying it needs to be local, it needs to be indigenous. We've been quite critical of, of outside involvement. Uh, uh, and yet, we're also are saying um, we, we, we want people to, to, to become, say, long-term missionaries or, or go and do a job in another part of the world. And it can seem contradictory, but, but, but I, I think there very much still is a place for long-term Christian service. But it's all about the, the mindset. It's all about the attitude. It's all about how you go in and how you partner uh, with, with local people, how you honor them, how you support what God is already doing instead of coming in to try and create um, your, 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 your own kingdom. And, 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 and yeah, OMF, we, we, we mobilize people to go to East Asia long term. But our workers, and maybe why it's such a hard sell to recruit long-termers anymore, um, they spend the first two years basically learning language and culture. They can go to a local church, but they're not to take up any positions of responsibility. They're just to be there um, to learn and to build relationships and to invest in, in language and culture learning. The next two years, they'll spend underneath a, a local believer or maybe a long-term missionary serving and learning. It's only maybe in their fifth or sixth year that they may be allowed to take some position of responsibility. And a lot of people don't like the sound of that. <laughs> it's not very appealing. They want to go and do stuff now uh, quickly and, and, uh, and be able to, 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 to tick it off. Uh, and and uh, uh, when we went to Bangladesh with, with SIM, we spent the six, first six months with our four-month-old baby living with a, with a Muslim family. And I can tell you we had insights and experiences that no book or course could ever taught us uh, about that culture and, and how things really are underneath the surface. While I was staying with them, I was told to, to work under um, two local evangelists. And I just went along with them places and I watched them and I listened and asked them questions and I learned so much stuff from them. Stuff that I never would have learned if I'd gone in as a superior uh, 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 and, and they had been under me, I never would have seen or learned or asked those questions. And what right would I have had anyway to be their superior? The only right I would have had that I had a foreign passport, so, so it seemed entirely appropriate. Um, and as I said, um, yeah, so we need people to go to other countries still, to make it their home, to deeply learn the language, the context, the culture, to build deep relationships of trust, because these very people often become those cross-cultural bridges those, for those international partnerships. They understand deeply that the context maybe of, of, of the, the person who wants to partner from outside and the context of the person in the country and, and they can be those advisors, they can be those facilitators. And, and I, I know our director, he often says, Peter Rowan, who's from here, often says we, he thinks we, we need more Apollos's than Paul's these days. You know, Paul planted, Apollos watered. And maybe we need more people with that mindset. I'm just gonna go and, and serve and water and see things flourish that, that God is, is already doing amongst his people. And, and, and this going long term and making someone your home, again, of course, it's no longer the West to the rest. It's everywhere to everywhere. Um, Christians moving in all directions for different reasons and being witnesses. In OMF UK and Ireland, I have colleagues who are from Hong Kong, from Indonesia, from South Korea, from Cambodia, from Japan, who've come here. They've learned this language, this very difficult language, this weird culture, and they have... Uh, uh, and their perspective, their approach is really enrich us, uh, and also they're enriching the local churches they go to and helping them with their, their witness. But in, finally, in trying to communicate this, I think we also need to be, be careful with our, our vocabulary, with our language, with our messaging. So we, we no longer talk about, we used to talk about home sides and, and field. 
Yeah, so, so this is the home side, you send people out to the field. Now we talk about centers. Yeah, we have multiple centers and they're all equal and they're all serving each other and, and traffic is, is, is going, going both ways. Um, we try in our media to show more images of, uh, of happy, healthy East Asians in, in modern high-tech cities, not just in remote um, jungle villages, which kind of our, our mission biography imaginations kind of uh, stir up when we, when we think of East Asia, but really isn't the context of reality that most people live in. We try and show pictures of East Asian workers, not just white workers. And this is all to undermine any sense of white savior messaging. Um, uh, uh, so we're very careful the way we speak, the images we show. And it's all about, um, we're saying, come and join in what God is already doing through his diverse community of people. You're, you're not coming to take over. You're not coming as to do start, to teach. You're coming to be part of something beautiful that God's doing. And, and, and to do that, you need to come and listen and learn and be humble and serve. And, and as you do that and start in that posture, avenues will open to, to bless and serve. Um, finally, I, I know um, particularly several Africans who feel very uncomfortable when they, the only images they ever see of Africa in their churches as of Africans who are sick and needy and impoverished. Of course, Africa is a vast and diverse continent and has many prosperous modern um, parts as well as great suffering. Uh, actually, I was very nervous. I, I wrote the notes and, uh, and then, then uh, Mark sent me his PowerPoint. I thought, oh my goodness, what if he's just shown uh, <laughs> a bunch of really negative images of Africa? I'll be, I'll be condemning him, but, but it, it's wonderful to see that the people in, in, in Mark's uh, PowerPoint look, they look so, so joyful and, and people I would want to get to know and, and I know could, could, could bless me. So we have to be careful with our, our, our images. And even when we tell our stories, we love our mission biographies. I, I do as well. Um, but but, but um, often they neglect the stories of Asians and African Christians who built um, the church around the world. Often the biographies focus on or they're pointing the point of view of the, of, 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 of the European or, or American missionary. And we see way back in 1936, this is a Chinese Bible school. All these guys, no one knows who they are anymore <laughs> or where they're buried, but they, they went out to, to build Christ Church in, in, in China. Uh, and let's let, let's remember that, uh, 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 and uh, and what how God has used them, uh, and finally uh, the future. It, how, how wonderful! Ultimately, we're part of a, a beautiful, diverse global church, and each part enriches the other. When one hurts, the other hurts. You know how 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 much we're paying for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan at the moment, and because they are our, our, our brothers and sisters, and we we hurt with them. Um, at, at the same time, we need each other. And the whole fullness of the kingdom of the gospel is only going to come when people of every nation and tribe and tongue come together and worship Jesus in unity, but in, but in their distinctiveness as well, and in the, the rich variety in which they, 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 have, they are worshiping God and seeking to follow him each in their, their own context. So this was an interesting magazine. It showed, the, I think, the first, it, it's, a, it's an OMF gathering, the top one in 1984, uh, and the next one is in 2006. And if you zoom in the 2006 one, uh, what a lovely, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, kind of mix of, of colors and ethnicities and, and backgrounds all serving to, to build the church in, in East Asia. Um, I think we're going to give the, the, the final word to someone that Mark is going to introduce. <laughs> So we started off um, with this idea that we don't need white saviors. Uh, white people providing help to non-white people in a self-serving manner. And it's a critique that goes directly to motivations, how, our, how we see the world, how our organizations function. Uh, we're speaking as uh, um, staff members of organizations that are part of MAP, uh, which is part of Global Connections, uh, who have just appointed Harvey Kriani as their new CEO. And Harvey said in a recent seminar, we need to learn how to engage in mission when all the missionary brings is the liberating gospel of Jesus Christ minus a superior culture that seeks to civilize. We're only scratching the surface of that today, but let's start by acknowledging that we're broken, that brokenness has consequences, that the things that we build, uh, organizations, systems, reflect our brokenness. John 15, uh, Jesus tells us that uh, he tells his disciples that they, he sees them as friends and commands them to love one another. So we repent of when we have not done that well. 
I repent of when I have not done that well. Uh, but I hope you're encouraged by the opportunities that we have to learn from one another. And as Nathaniel said, we really wanted to not miss the opportunity that technology gives us to hear uh, from one of our international partners. Uh, it's amazing what technology offers. I was talking about Henry earlier uh, in, my, in my talk, and I was just WhatsApping Henry this morning. Uh, this is what we can now do, and it's helpful. Um, so we're going to play a video recorded for us by Mrs. Monica uh, Chokoto. She is Vice Chair of Children of the Nations Malawi's Board, and she's Secretary of our newly formed Global Alliance Council. So we wanted to hear what she has to say about partnering well.
Amen. Lovely. <laughs> just uh, f- finally want to leave you with a, a, a slide, which we'll leave up, which just has some um, r- resources, the, the book that we've referred to in Helping Hurts, also a book I would highly recommend called Kingdom Without Borders. And there you can also find um, the links to the websites of MAP, our organizations, and also our personal emails, our work emails, and we would be delighted to um, hear from you if you want to ask us any questions or there's any way we can, we, we can partner. And we're not rushing off, so, so we'd be very happy to answer any questions or, or hear any comments you have um, uh, after, after we finish. And we're, we're finishing now, so thank you so much for, for being here and blessing us with your presence. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.